to Hope Online. My name is Becky. And I'm Luke. And we just want to say we're so pleased that you decided to join us today for church, especially if this is your first time. Maybe church isn't something that you usually do, so we just want to say an extra warm welcome to you. We want you to know that you are accepted and welcome here just as you are. If you are a student returning to Winchester after the break, or maybe you're a new student just beginning your studies, we want to say an extra warm welcome to you. We love having students as part of our community here. We can't wait to get to know you and serve you in any way that we can. Tribe is our family of students here at Hope. Tribe would love to connect with you over on their Instagram and Facebook accounts, so head on over and say hi. In this season where we are unable to meet together corporately, we are always looking for opportunities to equip the church, build community and reach the world around us. And you can do so by joining one of our existing small groups. However, we are really excited to, over the coming months, be launching, as we have before, themed sign-up small groups. And if you'd like to find out more about these, you can look at them on our hopewinchester.org website or by looking under My Groups in the My Church Suite app. Coming up today, we have Tim Blaber talking to us about Jesus the Redeemer. I can't wait to hear all he has to say. But first, John Pickett is going to be leading us in a time of worship. As we move into worship, feel free to sit or stand or participate as much as you feel comfortable with. But let's remember that today God wants to connect with us. He loves us and he's for us. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great You are faithful through every storm You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You have done great things God, you do great heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great Yeah. 
accept it and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great Upon that 
ground began to shake Stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your stay? Our resurrected King Has rendered you defeated The ground, the ground to shake, the storm was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? How resurrected King has rendered you defeated. rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death where is your sting Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified
what I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus And oh precious is the flow That makes me white as I'm Steve, I'm the senior pastor here at Hope Church and I've got a couple of extra things that I wanna share with you. The first is that next week we're going to be starting our week Pray With Hope. And it's uh, an encouragement for those of you who uh, wanna pray and, uh, and want help praying with yourself uh, or with other people during the week. And we're gonna be providing some tools to help you do that. Uh, next week and so that information will be coming out over the next few days. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is Commission. Hope Church is part of the Commission family of churches. There are about 60 or so churches in the UK and over a hundred uh, in India and uh, uh, over the last number of years we've been meeting together on August bank holiday weekend we've been camping together in the UK and uh, we've been uh, having great fellowship together and hearing from Guy Miller who uh, heads up uh, commission. Unfortunately this year we were unable to meet together because of the Covid restrictions on larger groups gathering and so we were unable to do that. Now one of the things that Commission does is that it supports local churches and local church elderships. Uh, it uh, provides training and uh, Tim Blaber is here part of Hope Church as uh, we transition to being a Commission training base here in Winchester. Uh, it helps uh, new churches get established around the UK and overseas and uh, it provides emergency aid uh, where that's needed uh, around the world. And so at the Commission gatherings uh, over August Bank Holiday weekend would have been Connect Festival last uh, uh, August, uh, uh, we would have taken up an offering and that offering would have gone towards the work of Commission. Of course, they were unable to do that. And so in this season, being a Commission church, we want to support them and so we're going to be taking up an offering at the beginning of October on the 4th of October and I want to give you advance warning of it. Now I know this is not a great season uh, for some of us in terms of the financial challenges that we're facing but I want to say there's no pressure but I want to encourage you to be prayerful, to be thinking about what you could give, to be bringing it before God. I don't want anyone to feel any pressure to give but I want us to encourage us to be a generous people as we look forward and we want to support Commission in all that they're doing. So just giving you advance warning of that, there'll be more details coming out in the next few weeks. Well good morning everyone. We're doing a series entitled Life with Jesus out of the book of 1st John and today we're looking at a few verses from chapter 2. I'm going to go straight into reading the passage and then giving a sense for where we're going to be going together. I'm very excited. This is a wonderful passage of scripture we're looking at today. So 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 
He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for these wonderful words we are looking at today. I thank you that they lead us to encountering Jesus and knowing him as our friend, as our advocate, as our help. Thank you that we can today confidently draw near to you, Father, because of what he has done, because of who he is, and because of the secure place we have in him. I pray would you speak to us and stir our hearts as we worship you. Amen. We're going to be looking at three things from this passage. First is this, that sin is our adversary. Sin is our adversary. Second, Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our advocate. And thirdly, Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. Let me also say right from the start that these are happy words for imperfect people. Now, I can't see you right now, but I'm not assuming if I was to say, put your hands up if you know you're perfect, anyone's going to, for a moment, be cocky enough to put their hand up. Okay, we all know we're imperfect people. We make all kinds of screw ups all the time. Uh, at least I know I do. And so these are happy words for people like me because they speak into the truth that whatever we've done, however we might be feeling about ourselves, we always have the opportunity to draw near to our Father in heaven. And we're going to see why. But the first thing that we're thinking about is sin and sin is our adversary. We've already heard about sin from Steve over the past couple of weeks as he's been going through chapter one. And I wonder how you react when you hear the word sin. The likelihood is that for some of you, that is a religious word associated with judgmental people. That those that talk about sin are the religious judgmental types that like to lambast fun and moan about those that do all kinds of naughty things like drinking and, um, and partying, going out, sex, whatever it might be. These things get categorised as being naughty and sinful by religious people. Um, and often the types of people who you look at and you think, I'm not really sure you have a better, more attractive alternative, to be honest. You look pretty miserable. And so when we hear the word sin, we can kind of react a little bit and anticipate something coming, which is going to annoy us or frustrate us or make us angry. Or perhaps just some might be thinking, I'm not sure I really want to listen to this, to be perfectly honest. If we're talking about sin, am I going to be judged? Am I going to be confronted? And often the religious people that speak about sin can be fairly hypocritical in how they live their own lives. So I, I recognize in using that word, it's loaded. Now, it's crucial that as we look at what the Bible has to say and when the Bible uses words like this, that we think of it in the right context and particularly we think about Jesus and, and how Jesus approaches the subject. Because actually Jesus also spoke a lot about sin. However, the sinners, the classical kind of immoral sorts, were drawn to him. And the ones that the religious people would lambast and have a go at, who were deterred from the religious types, were the very people that went to Jesus. They found him to be attractive. The sinners, the um, the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, who are often those categorized in this day and age as the sinful people, they love to be with Jesus. So much so that Jesus was often thought of as being one of them. Is he an immoral guy? Is he a sinner as well? Because these people hang around him. So clearly then, how Jesus spoke about this subject didn't result in people feeling judged people feeling condemned, people feeling alienated. Because what Jesus showed 
those that came near to him, who had that kind of a background, was that sin was in fact their enemy and not their friend. And that sin really, when understood properly, properly, isn't fun, doesn't lead to a happy place ultimately, but away from a happy place. So we're going to think about why that is the case. If sin is your enemy and is your adversary, then we need this enemy to be destroyed. If, if sin is something working against you from enjoying a fulfilled life, if sin is what's holding you back from knowing God, then a huge question is how do we deal with this sin? And, and how does Jesus offer us an insight into how we deal with this sin? Now, the reality is there is a, a wall that separates us from God, a barrier, a dividing wall, so that we can't know God until this wall has been demolished and this wall has been crushed. This is a wall that is built with the bricks of our own rebellion towards God our resistance towards God. So if you're somebody who's not yet a Christian and you say, I'm not sure I know who God is, that sense of distance from God, the Bible teaches, is because of an inherent resistance to him. Now that might sound a little bit strange, but the Bible teaches this very clearly that all of us from the very beginning have hearts that are unsubmitted to God. All of us from the very beginning have hearts that are resistant to him. And the Bible also teaches that God is angry with us for that reason. He is simultaneously angry with you and yet loving towards you. Now that might sound a little bit strange, I'm speaking to you if you don't know God. I'm speaking to you if you're not yet a Christian. This is how the Bible teaches. God is right now both moving towards you with love and angry with the fact that you're resisting his love. Now, you might think that's a very strange idea. So, t Tim, how, how can God be angry with me and loving me at the same time? Well, those of you who are parents will understand straight away how a parent can be both loving and angry towards their child at the same time. I have four children. I am well versed in these scenarios. It starts like this. You say to your child, don't climb that wall. And then it ends with a trip to the fracture clinic. And that's happened, uh, I have to confess, on several occasions. And so you feel love constantly towards your child, but angry that they have not listened to you, that they've resisted your loving guidance. And so that's how God is also towards us. His anger and his wrath, which the Bible talks about a lot, is his response to his love being resisted by men and women. It's really important we understand that. His wrath, his anger, is an expression of his love being resisted by men and women. He wants you to know his love. He wants you to know him. He wants you to be drawn into relationship with him. He knows that the best thing for you to live this life fully and with great sense of purpose and security and hope, he knows that the best way that you're going to know true rest deep down is by coming into a true, vibrant knowledge of him as your father. That's what he wants you to know. And sin is your adversary, is your enemy, because that's what's preventing you from receiving, in a sense, his love. We need this to be dealt with. We need this barrier. We need this wall to be demolished. We need this enemy to be crushed. We need this enemy to be defeated. 
Now, the good news, the wonderful news, is that's what the gospel tells us, is how this enemy of ours, this adversary of ours, this sin, this wall, how it's been destroyed. It's been destroyed in the work of Jesus Christ. That's what the cross is all about. At the cross, Jesus pays our penalty. At the cross, Jesus crushes the enemy, our sin, evil, the powers of evil. And in defeating the powers of evil over us, we are released, as it were, from its stranglehold. We are released from its power. We're no longer, the Bible says, slaves to sin. We're no longer captive by it because Jesus has defeated this great power at the cross. And so it says in the Bible that we die to sin and we're made alive in Christ. So if you don't know God yet, the great news for you is that you can know him by looking to Jesus, which is what we're doing in this passage. So the next thing then for us to think about is Jesus as our advocate. Now, when you become a Christian, when you receive Jesus into your life, when you say, do you know what? I'm going to no longer am I going to live for myself. No longer am I going to try and figure out this life in the power of my own strength. I'm going to look to Jesus and put my trust in him. At that moment, a fundamental change happens in your life in relation to the nature and power of sin. You are no longer, as I've just said, under its power. You're released from its power. But that doesn't mean to say, sadly, that you stop sinning. And as we saw in verse 8, John says, if we say we have no sin, then we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Hey, we struggle with sin every single day. And you might say, well, I thought by becoming a Christian that the struggle would be over. No, that's not true. The reality is that the battle, the fight against sin doesn't end when you become a Christian. That's when it begins. It begins when you become a Christian. The Bible teaches clearly you're powerless to do anything about sin before a greater power comes into your heart, the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's at that point of becoming a Christian that suddenly you start to fight sin. You start to resist sin. You have new desires in your heart, new affections in your heart. You have a, a disposition now towards worshipping God. Jesus, who has made this way for you to come to the Father by demolishing this wall of hostility, by defeating the power of sin. You now have this way to the Father to come and to be in his presence now. And that means that you are driven deep within you by a longing to be with God. That's a new passion that's come. That's a new desire that's come. And so you see sin differently. No longer is sin for you this power or even just this best, best way of living, the full fun life. You've seen sin for what it really is, your adversary, your enemy, because you know the best place for you to be is in God's presence. The best way for you to live is in the Father's house. Do you know, when Jesus spoke to his disciples about his mission, he said this, um, I am, he said, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's really interesting. Jesus doesn't say, no one comes to forgiveness except through me, although that's true. He doesn't say, no one comes to eternal life except through me, although that's true. He doesn't say, no one comes into paradise except through me, although that's also true. What he says is no one comes to the Father except through me. So the mission of Jesus is to make a way for you and I to come to the Father. Elsewhere, he says, in my Father's house are many rooms and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. So the place for us to be is the Father's house. Well, what's that? 
simply put, it's that you get to say, home is with God. Home is with the Father. And so you have conferred onto you all the privileges, all the rights that sons and daughters have in their father's home, in their father's house. You get to be there, you get to dwell there just as Jesus did. And sin is what kind of is trying to pull you away from that place. But as a Christian, you know, you can resist this now. You say, no, I know I want to be with God. I know that's where I need to be. And I know that's where I need to dwell. So we fight. We fight, we fight, we fight. And even though the power of sin has been defeated over us, the reality is the temptations remain. Why is that? I hear you ask. If it's defeated and if the power is gone over me, if I'm no longer in bondage and in slavery to this, why do I keep screwing up? Why is it that I still have lustful thoughts? Why is it that I, I still say stupid things and react in stupid ways? Well, that's because you live in a fallen body. This flesh has not yet been glorified. This flesh, this body of mine, has not yet received the full glorious benefits of what Christ has done on the cross. One day it will. One day this mortal body will be clothed in immortality. I will receive a glorified body like the body Jesus has, which won't have any temptation towards sin. But right now, this flesh of mine is fallen. Your bodies, our flesh, our minds have not yet been perfected. Now, within us, we have a new spirit. We've been made to be a new creation. It's true to say that in your inner being, you have now received something of your eternal state in that you are alive in your spirit to God. So your spirit longs, longs for him. But your flesh wars against your spirit. Now that's an idea which Paul speaks about a lot in Romans. He says that we are, our spirit is at war with our flesh. Because in the depths of my being, I want to please God. I want to worship him. I want to glorify him. I want to dwell in his house. I know as I'm worshiping him, there's no place I'd rather be. I know that a thousand years elsewhere wouldn't compare to one day in his house. I know these things are true. And yet still I mess up and still I, I screw up because I'm battling against my flesh. But we have the power to overcome and and that's a power that we've received so if you have that you go you know i recognize that i you should be encouraged the longing to live a life to please god is a new longing that comes to the christian a longing to fight sin is a new longing that comes to the christian it's a battle that begins when you become a christian it doesn't end there so be encouraged but here's the thing this is what john says so jesus is our advocate now, let's just look at the second half of um, verse one. He, he says this, if anyone does sin, why does he use the word if? Like he's established that we do and that we will. He says the word if because sinning now is to err as a Christian. It's not your steady state. It's not your default position. Your default position, as we've just said now, is a desire to enjoy God, is a desire to be with the Father. That's your default position, but you will err and you will sin, as he's already said. But he says, if you do, and when you do, here's the thing. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. You have an advocate you, it's a legal term. You've got someone who is your defender. Jesus comes to your defense. And, and here's what it means. It means that when you sin as a Christian, you don't have to hide and run away. When you screw up as a Christian, the temptation will follow, which will say, you can't pray. You can't worship. 
how dare you sing to God after what you've done? Is it just me? Or do you know those moments and, and you, you have those times where you, you hear that voice? You are to resist that voice because that is not God speaking to you. What we need to hear is that Jesus is advocating for us. Jesus is coming to our defence in that moment. And he is making constantly, he's constantly applying to us the victory of his death. He's constantly applying to you the fact that he has died and conquered all of your sin, all of it. So that when you come to pray and you come to worship the Father, you never find your confidence in that moment from your performance. Never. Never, ever, ever. My confidence to pray and to worship and to enjoy God never is found in how well I have done but in how well Jesus has done. Always. It's always about his performance. We are brought to the Father by Jesus. We are, as it were, trophies of his cross, of his achievements, of his victories. He presents you to the Father. And he presents you as someone he has cleansed, washed, purified and forgiven. You are in Christ. So here's the question. Does Jesus belong in the Father's house? Is Jesus worthy to embrace the Father? Is Jesus worthy to speak to the Father? Is Jesus worthy to, to praise and worship the Father? Well, of course he is. And you are in him. I am in him. So irrespective of how well or how poorly I've done, my confidence is found in Jesus and in what he has done. He's my advocate. He's the one making the case. And when he makes the case before the Father for you, it's not like he's bending down on his knees and pleading. It's not like he's saying, oh, please, Father, just give him another chance. That's not the case at all. That's not what's happening. He is advocating on the basis of the fact that he's already done everything that's required for you and I to gain access. Because Jesus is not only our advocate, he is also our atoning sacrifice. It says here, our atoning sacrifice in verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That word atoning literally means to make favourable. Which means that, you know what I was speaking earlier about God's anger towards us? At the cross... Jesus takes that onto himself. So the righteous anger that of course God has towards evil and wickedness and my sin, he's a good judge. He's, a, he's totally holy. He's right to be angry with sin. But he, Jesus takes that upon himself. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sin. He's paid the price and he's our advocate. And it says here, he's righteous or he's just. So you have Jesus Christ going to the Father, pleading on your behalf, not for mercy, but for justice. That's a crucial point. Jesus is pleading not for mercy from the Father. He's not asking the Father to act in a generous way, he's asking the Father for justice. Why? Because Jesus has already paid the price. So he is establishing in us the victory of his cross. He is boasting in what he has done. So it's justice for you and I to come to the Father and to worship him. It's justice because Jesus has paid the penalty for my sin and for yours. He's our advocate. He's our atoning sacrifice. He has done it all. We are now free from all judgment. We're free from all condemnation. So if you feel condemned, if you feel judged, 
know this, that doesn't come from God. (laughs) He doesn't judge you. He loves you. And he loves what Jesus has done for you. At the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. Our boast is in his work, not ours. Our confidence to pray, our confidence to worship, our confidence to be Christians is not found in our performance, it's found in his. This is how Luther, the great reformer, puts it. When the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell, and what of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall also be. Isn't that brilliant? When you're accused... When you, f- you hear the devil taunting you and bringing your sin to your mind, you hit back and you say, you shut up and hear this. Jesus has done everything that's necessary. My boast was never in myself. It's entirely in him and he's never done anything wrong. He lived a perfect life. He lived the life I could never live. He dealt with my sin. I know what I bring to the table. I know my sin and there's a thousand more on top of it. Jesus has done everything. He is my boast. He is my advocate. He is the atoning sacrifice. Hallelujah. Now what that means for us now is that we have peace with God, rest for our souls. We need to all be encouraged because we will all need to resist those urges to hide when we sin. It was also interesting, let me just, I'm about to finish, but let me just show you this. You can just look at, uh, at verse one, the second half, where it says this, but if anyone does sin, he doesn't then say, you have an advocate with the Father. He says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That's a really significant detail not to miss. Why is it significant? Because this is John who's writing this letter. This is John, the beloved disciple who who knew Jesus so intimately, who saw Jesus feed the 5,000, raise the dead, calm the storms. He saw Jesus crucified and resurrected. And John needs an advocate. Why? Because John sins as well because he's not perfect. And I don't know about you, but I find that encouraging. If this man who wrote some brilliant scripture, who had such profound insights, if he needs an advocate, and so do I. We have one in Jesus. Now I wanna finish by reading to you an old hymn that Wesley wrote. And this hymn captures so brilliantly all that we've been looking at in this passage. So I'm going to read it out and I just want to encourage you to allow these words to magnify again all we've been seeing in this passage of all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus is for us. So let's listen to these words together. The hymn is called Arise My Soul, Arise. Arise my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, my name is written on his hands. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh forgive him, they cry, nor let that ransomed sinner die. The father hears him pray, his dear anointed one, He cannot turn away the presence of his son. His spirit answers to the blood and tells me I am born of God. My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child. I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh and Abba, Father, I cry. Father, I thank you for 
our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he lived the life I couldn't. Hallelujah that he has given me his righteous robes, his purity, his perfection. Thank you that we have confidence to come to you today. And our confidence is not found in our performance, but in his. I thank you he pleads not mercy for us, but justice. As he attributes to us the victory of his cross over all of our sin. And I thank you the way is therefore made for us to be in the Father's house as beloved sons and daughters, that all the privileges that are Christ's he shares with us, that we're co-heirs with him. I pray, Lord, would that truth drop deeply into our hearts today, that we would enjoy the privileges we have as sons and daughters. And for those that haven't put their faith in you yet, help them to know sin is their adversary, is their enemy but Jesus is their friend. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tim. That was such an inspiring talk. If you were encouraged by this morning, why not send a link to a family member or a friend and really pray that God encourages them to. If you are watching this live and would like prayer for anything at all, we have a great team who would love to pray with you over on Zoom. We also have a Zoom cafe for anyone and everyone watching this where we would love to chat with you and connect with you. The links to both of those Zoom events are in the description below or in our live chat. And do connect with us on all of our social media channels on Instagram and Facebook. I hope you had a wonderful time with us this morning. Do join us again next week. Thank you.